Sorry. <laughs> I'll start that again. Got a little brief interruption. Welcome to IndyCar on the 11th of January. You will have heard me talking many times about the fact that Scotland is in a treaty with England, um, which actually is the thing which keeps the union in place. It is this treaty which means that Scotland is not a part of the United Kingdom. It's not being subsumed. It's not part of a larger country. It's in a treaty with another country. It's always been the case ever since 1707 when the treaty was signed. The fact that the um, English government, or the king at the time, decided that uh, they would enter into a treaty with Scotland rather than just simply marching over the border with an army and conquering the place was a mistake, really, strategically, um, from the point of view of the the UK as it currently is, the fact that they entered into a treaty was a bit of a blunder because at the time the nobility in England believed that once Scotland was in this treaty it was basically trapped and having decided very magnanimously to offer a handful of MP seats to the Scots government of the time I suppose um, in the Parliament at Westminster, they thought that the Scots would always be outvoted, and so the Parliament of Westminster, which they had decided was then the um, the sovereign holder, if you like, of this newly formed Great Britain, would always be able to outvote the Scots, and so the Scots would never ever uh, be able to escape from the Union because we would simply be outvoted by English MPs. Now, of course, that worked for a long, long time, and it worked all the way up until about what, 2011 approximately, when the SNP won an outright majority in the devolved parliament at Edinburgh. And that, of course, led to, in fact, it was before that, I beg your pardon, but anyway, it led to the, the creation of the first independence referendum, which Alex Salmond negotiated with uh, Westminster. David Cameron signed off on the Edinburgh Agreement, um, and that was effectively the way in which that referendum was self-executing because the British state had agreed that if the Scots voted yes toward to independence in 2014 that it would become independent, that the English state would recognise it. Now the reason I'm mentioning the fact that this treaty is a treaty and that Scotland wasn't simply conquered in the way that many countries were back in the 17th century and 16th century is important because in 1969 the United Nations passed a new um, international law. It was known as the Geneva Convention of 1969. Now the Geneva Convention, in fact several years ago I think I looked into the Geneva Convention and um, what is interesting about the Geneva Convention is it deals specifically with international treaties between countries and it looks at the, the ways in which states can exit from a treaty if certain things are not done correctly or if laws are broken. Now the Geneva Convention has several articles which deal with the ways in which smaller states might break up uh, a treaty or exit from a treaty and they're kind of listed in no particular order but essentially there are four articles which deal with how you can escape from a treaty. Now the first one uh, looks at how the treaty was signed. In fact, they all really look at the circumstances under which the smaller state signed a particular treaty. And they look at things, first of all, such as fraud. Now, fraud, as you know, can be almost any kind of deception uh, in which the perpetrator is conning the other party into doing something they want them to do. Now, it's kind of obvious that there was a lot of fraud around the time of this uh, signing. The, the British state made all sorts of promises and threats, and we'll come back to threats in a moment. The second part of the article says, or the second article in the Geneva Convention dealing with this topic, um, talks about corruption. Corruption of the representative of the other party, and that would mean bribery. Offering inducements to the representative of the smaller state to sign the document. And we know this happened. We know it happened because history tells us that the British state paid off the debts of several of those Scottish negotiators in order to persuade them to sign this treaty. And then <laughs> it comes to coercion. Coercion is usually some kind of personal threat or blackmail. 
And that was done using a thing called the Alien Act. The Alien Act was a threat by the British state, or I should say the English state at the time, which would have confiscated the lands of Scottish nobles who owned lands or certain lands and properties in England and would have made it impossible for them to keep those. So that was one of the ways that they uh, were corrupt, well, they were coerced forced into doing something that they didn't really want to do. And there were other forms of coercion applied as well to the Scottish negotiators. And the fourth item on this list of things that the larger party might do, which would make the, uh, the treaty challengeable in legal uh, terms, was the threat. Now, it's usually the threat of force, and that was certainly already there. In terms of threats, there was already a naval blockade in place before the treaty was signed. And that league, that British blockade, that English blockade, I should say, made sure that no single ship could leave a Scottish port to resupply any part uh, of the, at the time, the only colony which Scotland had at Darien in Panama. So they were basically blockading Scotland from resupplying its only single uh, colony at Panama. And so they starved them out. And so that threat was there as well. But the main threat was the fact that there was a host, an English army, massing on the other side of the border prior to the signing of this treaty. Now, although the threat of force was not explicit, the fact that there was an army assembling south of the border would have been known to the Scottish negotiators, would have been known to everybody in Scotland at the time. And of course, because there was no democracy in Scotland at the time, nobody could ever claim that this was a voluntary union because no ordinary Scot had any voting rights about whether or not this treaty should be signed. Scottish parliamentarians had a vote, but they were the ones who were being bribed, coerced, forced, whatever you want to say. And so the whole thing was basically a forced union. It was not voluntary in any way at all. Now, the big problem with the Vienna Convention, and everybody points this out, is the Vienna Convention dates only from 1969, and, of course, the Treaty of Union goes back to 1707. But does that mean that there's no way to challenge uh, the legality of the UK Union? I don't think there is actually a reason why you couldn't invoke the Articles um, of the Vienna Convention, simply because England chose to make this a treaty. If they had simply conquered Scotland, it would have been very much more difficult for us to do anything about getting out of the Union, because we would simply have been conquered and absorbed into another country. Scotland would no longer exist as it does at the moment. It would be a part of Great Britain. Great Britain would have been a country and not a treaty involving two countries. Uh, and therefore it wouldn't be challengeable. And this is what happened to Catalonia, because Catalonia, unfortunately, was absorbed simply into Spain because of the Spanish Constitution. The Spanish Constitution stated that Catalonia was a Spanish territory and would remain so uh, under, the, Scottish, uh, under the, the Constitution of Spain. Now, England did not and still does not have a written constitution which claims Scotland as anything at all. It, it's just not there. The English government does not have a constitution which states that Scotland is part of Great Britain and no longer exists as a nation. And so the legalities of this are much more in our favour. And I think you could certainly use the articles of the Vienna Convention as the basis for a legal challenge. And it might well be that that is exactly what will happen. As you know, Salvo is in the process of formulating all sorts of plans at the moment. They may or may not involve the Vienna Convention. Uh, my own opinion is that the Vienna Convention must form some part of the legal challenge because the, the Vienna Convention is a modern day piece of international law, which allows parties or countries which are in treaties with each other to exit those treaties if they were unfairly coerced or forced or corrupted so that this, uh, these signatories were gained in a dishonest way. And that's easy to prove because history already shows that that's what happened. It's already written down. The history of the Treaty of Union is very, very clearly written. It's been recorded for the last three centuries. So when you look at the treaty in terms of 
modern democracy doesn't stand up because there was no democracy at the time it was signed. The fact that it's a treaty was a mistake, a blunder by the English state at the time who didn't realise that, you know, 300 years from the time of signing that international laws would have changed in favour of the smaller parties, giving them more of a balance in terms of renegotiating or ending a treaty if they wanted to. So there is a basis here, I believe, for a challenge to the United Kingdom's um, claim of sovereignty over Scotland. But remember that the terms of the Treaty of Union guaranteed that English and Scottish laws remain separate for all time. And that means Scottish law and the Scottish Constitution, which is a part of Scottish law, still stands to this day. And that means the two countries are still separate and they are still in a treaty. So a treaty can be dissolved. It just takes the political will to both prepare a legal case and to stand up to the British state and say, that's enough. We are going to give our people a vote and they can decide whether they want to stay in this union or not once they know how the treaty was arrived at and what methods the English state at the time used to make sure that those Scottish negotiators signed that treaty under duress, um, under all kinds of different methods of fraud, corruption, coercion and threats of force. And because of that, the treaty cannot stand in modern political international law. And that really is, I think, something that we all need to know about because many people in Scotland are completely ignorant of the history of the treaty, how it was arrived at and why it was signed in the first place, given the fact that over 98% of the people of Scotland who didn't have a vote violently disapproved of it being signed and in fact the people who signed it, those negotiators, had to go into hiding because there were thousands of people on the streets trying to hunt them down to kill them. <laughs> and that shows you the strength of feeling against the Union, although we will never know exactly how many tens of thousands or millions of Scots at that time um, heartily disapproved of it signing and would never have voluntarily gone into the Union in the first place. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting little piece of historical information that you might find intriguing and possibly a little bit more uh, encouraging when it comes to fighting our own case in the next few years. And I think we will hear more of the Vienna Convention and more of international law and the United Nations Charter itself, which guarantees that all peoples have the right to self-determination, including Scotland. We are no exception. In fact, in many ways, we are an exemplar of exactly why self-determination self must remain uh, a part of applied international law at all times. That's it from Andy Carr today. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you to everybody who has written to me and spoken to me in the last week just in the street. Keep the, the donations coming if you can afford to do so. Thank you very much for your continued support, and I'll see you all in the next few days. Keep the faith. Bye for now.